Do not be frightened. Let's get close and personal. I can't see them as well. What I've done in my class is that I can probably take down the class. Everyone, oh, if no one sits there, yeah, that's cool. All right, well, um, welcome to our second of this lunchtime interview series. So tomorrow we have um, Robert McBride from the Rockingham Museum and Arts Project. We'll be talking with Joe Chang from the Taiwanese company oh. Puppet and its double about making community art spaces and, and access to the arts in community in Leeds, Taipei, uh, in Taiwan, and here in our own region. So I hope you'll be back for that tomorrow. And um, I hope you all know, I think, here in the meantime, what's happening for the rest of the day. So I'm not going to spend time doing that. I'm just going to turn it over to John. Whoa. So I'm, I'm John Potter, I'm the executive director of the Latches Theater, uh, right up the street from where we are today. We're celebrating our 80th birthday today. Uh, that's the end of my shameless plug. And you're here. And, you're here. and I'm thrilled, thrilled to be here and thrilled to get away a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but we're, our friendship with uh, Sandglass Theater runs uh, long and deep, so we're very pleased to uh, be intertwined um, and working on this together. Um, Words like inclusion and diversity are on a lot of lips these days, uh, people talking about the arts and, and everything else. Uh, as an example, Americans for the Arts issued a statement in 2016 that acknowledged, quote, cultural equity is critical to the viability of, of the arts sector. Uh, the Canada Council for the Arts in its uh, current strategic plan identified as one of its goals, quote, to strengthen Support and support enabling a culture of participation, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, and Carol McCord of Alternate Roots wrote, I imagine an arts field that becomes a beloved community, manifesting a culture of generosity based on principles of inclusion, diversity, and equity, and rejecting the politics of fear. There are many laudable examples of progress and practice of inclusion in the arts and elsewhere. Uh, I'll cite as one example, uh, Moving Beyond Inclusion, which uh, a collaboration which brought uh, six of Europe's leading dance companies together, um, united by the fundamental belief that working inclusively produces more exciting um, and uh, uh, more enlivened uh, artistic work. Uh, it's very encouraging to hear. Yet there is more to be done as a 2014 article by Sean C. Harris titled Diversity and Inclusion in the Arts Are Not Enough reminds uh, readers that many efforts, however well-meaning, are misguided. Quote, whenever people talk about diversity and inclusion, the underlying question seems to be, how do we get them to join us? The real question needs to be, how can we work in solidarity with them? Today we'll be examining the topic of changing our perception of disability through an inclusive theater practice in the UK and Vermont. And with us are Ben Pettit-Wade, Artistic Director of Hijinx, one of the UK's leading inclusive theater companies, uh, as well as Laura Lawson Tucker and Darlene Jensen, co-founders of the theater adventure program of New England Youth Theater, a stone's throw away from here. So we're very pleased to all be together up here. I don't think we can applaud enough for, for all these folks up here, so it's great to hear. Uh, I'm going to start with Ben. Um, if you could shed some light on Hijinx, what it does, how it does it, and, and how you came to be uh, involved. So that's a loaded, loaded series of questions. But. Um, so I'll start with Hijinx. Uh, Hijinx is a company that's been around since 1984. It was founded. Um, initially, it wasn't uh, an inclusive theatre company, so a company um, that works in the way we do now. It was a touring company going to small scale venues. I've been told to speak up. Do I need to speak up? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm going to small, small scale venues. Uh, about 20 years ago, they, they, the company became interested in making inclusive work. We had a community group called Odyssey, uh, which actually reminded me a lot of the group, obviously, you have 
um, a theatre theater adventure. It's a large group of performers, both with and without disability, that simply had a passion to perform. Um, and that group still exists today as our sort of community arm of the work that we do. But alongside it, we make professional touring productions that include casts um, with neurodiverse casts. Um, to do that and to maintain the professionalism and quality, we have our own training program for our performers, uh, which we call our academies, um, which we started in 2012. And they are, they meet two days a week um, throughout the year. It's an ongoing program, so it's not like a, um, you know, a, a course where you're doing a year or two years and then we say goodbye to people, we're working with people kind of in an ongoing process over a number of years. Um, and on the, those courses, the tutors, we have a pool of tutors that teach whatever their specialism may be. So whether that's clown, um, puppetry, uh, improvisation, uh, movement, etc. Um, and we have five, we now have five academies around Wales. So we've got two in Cardiff, one in West Wales, one in North Wales, and one in Mid Wales. So overall, we're working with about 70 adults um, with learning disability and or autism uh, on those courses. So uh, here today, actually, we have Lindsay on the front row here, Gareth and Richard, who are overjoyed that they get to spend the next hour listening to me. <laughs> 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 Um, but th they're, they're kind of products and members of our academies, um, but also in the production Meet Fred that we'll be performing today. And so we then take students that have been kind of embedded in the training to work in smaller groups to make the productions. All our productions are devised, um, so <coughs> it's a collaborative process, so everyone has input into, into the making. Um, and then we tour our productions both nationally around the UK uh, and internationally. Um, our aim, if you like, our vision, is to change perceptions of um, neurodivergent uh, members of our society within kind of both our own country and others, and to, to present a positive um, perspective, I guess, um, through the power and quality of the work that we're presenting. Um, so that's our touring work. Now, we also have a lot of other stuff we do as an organization. So we have a festival called the Unity Festival, um, which we started about 10 years ago. It's going into its 10th edition um, in 2019. And that celebrates um, companies that have a similar ethos to our own um, from around the world. So we, it's an international program alongside workshops, uh, sort of kind of a week long in venues. That started originally because uh, we're luckily, lucky enough to be based, uh, our office is in quite a prestigious um, theatre called the Wales Millennium Centre in Cardiff. Um, but at the time, 10 years ago, it was very difficult for companies like our own to get a platform in those sorts of spaces, a sort of mainstream, if you like theatre venues. Um, so it was an opportunity for us to form a partnership uh, with one of those venues uh, to present a festival. They were very keen on it and so um, each year since then they've been a partner on the festival and they basically give over a week of their venue to us to program. Um, and through the festival actually, I mean that's been a big part of how the company's developed and how our work has become more international because obviously through running the festival we got to meet a lot of people you know like-minded people like ourselves some of whom also would have their own festivals and so we they created a little bit of an exchange between us and other companies especially around Europe to be able to start to take our work outside of the UK um, so I've done the Academy I've done our touring productions I've done the festival um, and obviously Odyssey is still running, which is a sort of our community work. We also have something we call Drama Foundations, which is for um, adults that have an interest in drama, but in reality aren't 
going to be able to um, kind of follow it as a professional sort of venture, um, but would but it's a benefit to kind of social um, and confidence building. Um, so yeah, so that basically are drama groups, um, and we've just launched a film strand to the work we do. So uh, over the next five years. Um, the students are going to have more of a focus in some of the sessions on developing um, skills for camera um, and there's a sort of program put in place where we're going to produce a number of short films over the next five years and try and get those out to um, sort of film festivals and that sort of stuff. Um, and the other thing we do, because <laughs> actually the difficulty of the company has grown, you know, hugely in the last five years, we've mm -hmm. sort of quadrupled really in size of what we're doing um, and with that comes difficulties um, so to be working with 70 you know people that we're training around the country obviously those people you know they want opportunities as well to, to go beyond that training to find work and the reality is as a company we can't serve all those people in what we're doing um, and give them those sort of professional opportunities that for example Richard Garrett and Lindsay have had with me Fred um, we don't have the capacity to do that. So, so we also try and advocate and encourage external companies, uh, whether theatre companies, to, to work with us to cast our performers, mm -hmm. and we have offer kind of packages to support them through that mm -hmm. process. Um, and also casting directors in film and television. Mm -hmm. So more and more now we're getting casting directors get in touch with us because we've, we have our own acting agency um, so on our website, that's got a separate part of the website where each of the students have a, a very short showreel kind of introduction video for each one um, where you can click through and, and have a look and see and sort of meet online and arrange a casting and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's, so, so that's, that's it. So that's it. That's, that's all. all. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, um, we, we keep very busy. It's very busy. And how did you personally find your way to this, this work? Um, so I, I trained in drama in Liverpool. Um, we, I finished in college a, a group of uh, fellow students. We formed our own company for a <coughs> couple of years that, that toured. On a, through doing that, I learned a lot both about the, sort of the management side of kind of getting toured together and the funding and all that sort of stuff, um, as well as small-scale touring um, but then I kind of I, I, I applied for a job in London for a company called Spare Tire Theatre Company who are a community theatre company so they make work with all sorts of different communities within London they work with older people with um, gay and lesbian community um, and one of the groups they're working with was a group of performers um, with learning disability and or autism um, and yeah, I had no, I, before that I had no surreal kind of concept or mm -hmm. thinking this is what I wanted to do, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, but walking into that room, the, the, what came across was the absolute, the welcome that you got, um, and from witnessing the work that the group were doing, I became very excited about the potential and um, the creativity really that was, that was in that room, um, and what could happen if you allowed that creativity to, to blossom. Um, so I worked there for about four years or so um, with that group and then I took a couple of years just sort of out going and teaching English in Poland and moving around <laughs> doing different stuff around Europe kind of not knowing you know not really not knowing exactly where, where I wanted to go from that point but that time away made me realize that what I really missed was, was this group of performers with, um, that I had been working with. And, you know, so I took that time away and it took that really to make me realize that that's what I wanted to sort of carry on doing. And I, I applied for the job at Hijinks while in Poland and, and came back for the interview. That was about 12 years ago. So I started in that role as what we call the outreach officer, which was basically organizing projects within the community um, and then have worked myself up up to artistic director in the 12 years 
rinse bin. You make good use of your time away. Yeah. 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 Moment, I, think. I think and having that space to sort of refocus and um, find that kind of realization that, that that's you know that was the that was the thing. Mm. <laughs> cool. And you got to the place of missing. Yeah. And that's yeah. very instructive. Yeah. So let's hear a little bit about theater adventure in, in listening to Ben. Um, lots of similar ethos and basic principles. The, the, the um, shape of uh, tap is different, but the bones seem to be very similar mm. to what goes on in hijinks, um, at least my impression. Let's hear um, some of uh, tap's story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I'm Laura, this is Darlene. And Darlene and I met um, eight, 19, probably getting close to 20 years ago. And Darlene has a son with various disabilities. And I had an <coughs> early childhood program, and Elijah was one of my students. And we both as educators kept talking. We both as educators kept, Darlene and I kept talking about, because um, my orientation as an early childhood teacher was uh, dramatic arts and storytelling and lots of movement and and was always wanting, to, <clears throat> always wanting to help my young children have lots of opportunities to work together as a group with their creativity and, and with lots of drama. And so we started talking about Elijah, and Elijah, I really embraced this thought of helping Elijah enter my group of six typically developing children. Um, and, and I learned so much. It was really my first experience, intimate experience, of working with a person with disabilities. And so this is physical and cognitive challenges. And, um, and I think what that, and we kept talking about creativity and opportunities for people with disabilities, and specifically in Brattleboro and in, in Southern Vermont. And, and Darlene will start talking in a moment, but Darlene was discovering Sadly, that opportunities that, that her son could do, Elijah could do, we describe as a tag-along experience. So you talk the director into enrolling <laughs> your child with disabilities, and that director says, warily, well, okay. And not to blame anyone, because it's lack of experience and knowledge. And then, um, and the parent or the caregiver is assisting that person to to participate, but never really becomes part of the group. Right. There's never any people didn't know how to accommodate and to um, tweak their program to open more doors for someone who had physical or cognitive challenges. That's why I called it tag along. It was like, yeah, great. Yeah, you can join us, but we're not going to do anything differently. <coughs> so when we decided to have a theater program, um, we wanted it to be sort of what we ended up calling the reverse inclusion model of everything was determined by the people who had disabilities and what their needs were. And if typically developing people came into the program, they they had to tag along with us. Well, it wasn't tag along. They had yeah, to they adjust. They had to adjust they and come adjust. in with us. So. <clears throat> so we so we launched Theater Venture with New England Youth Theater. Um, we talked to Stephen Stearns, the founder and director, and we didn't have to work very hard at all. <laughs> that we had this idea, and then <clears throat> we very we felt very strongly that to start a new program. Um, to give it, you know, credence, to give it, um, like, value, it, we thought it would be more powerful if we were part of a larger established program, I mean, organization such as New England Youth Theater. And Stephen was very, very open, as he is as a person and as an artist. And, and he said, yep, great, great, Lauren Darlene, I'll find the money and you run it. And we're like, great, wonderful. So about four months later, he got the first grant of $5,000. He said, okay, go for it. So that first summer, 2004, was a one-week program. And because we're educators, we were quite plugged into 
youth, children and youth in our area. And we easily enrolled, I think we had 12, 12. that first year. Um, and just dove in to um, using borrowed space. This is before this building on Flat Street existed. And, um, and, it, be and it was a one week program and, and it became clear, oh my goodness, we have like the tip of the iceberg here. And there's a, there was a groundswell of interest. And, and what I felt was, oh, I might get a little bit teary here, but what I felt was that um, there were so many people in our extended community with so much to say and offer creatively as a creative person that has, had never had an opportunity. And they were just like jumping at the chance. And so we dove into it and we learned tons. And before we knew it, in a few years, you know, we, I mean, our, our peak of performances, what two, then we were like crazy. 2008, we had eight productions. And we were like, ah! So we were in classes. We went from a summer program, added a fall class, and added two more classes, and boom! <laughs> and there we were. And we just, you know, we weren't uh, seasoned enough to know we this is way too much. But but what was great though was that so like this this momentum was developing, and so many youth and then adults were coming forward and saying, "I love to perform. I love this." So you saw a little bit of that yesterday for sure. And, and so many of our students today have been with us for whether it be 15 years, 13 years, 12 years, 11 years, because they're so dedicated. So that's kind of the roots of where we are. And we grew so much, we're still part of Northern Venue Theater, but we moved to a new space that's really big, and we can practice in our performing space every week, which is essential. And that's at the West Village Meeting House in West Brattleboro. And that's the Unitarian Universalist Church. And that's, this is now, we're just starting our seventh year in that space. And that's been really exciting, really exciting. So It expanded, being in the bigger space and being able to be on our stage every single class, um, our students taught us that they had more to contribute and more to the to the whole production because, you know, sometimes they would do something that very naturally, like we would say, you know, you're going to exit from over here and they'd exit from somewhere else. And it was just natural that that's what their character would have done. And, you know, we were more thinking, you know, this is the logistics of it. And they were like, oh yeah, right, that makes sense. So then we realized we had a more collaborative process going on um, either, you know, by all different ways of communication, either just by doing what they felt naturally or saying, oh, I think this or I think that, or what if we did this, what if we did that. So it was just very interesting to, um, to be open to that and find how, you know, even moving a space brings out new creativity and new expression within people. I think one of the things as I listen to both, both your stories, um, thinking of the uh, initial walking into the room for the first time or the first gathering. And um, right away the mindset is, you know, we're not serving creativity to a population. We are in the presence of creativity and we are, we are to stir it up and inspire it and, and, and let it out. And, and, and to me, uh, that feels like um, a barrier that other people would not, um, would not get to as quickly as you did, but that was sort of day one out, out going. But uh, you know, let's talk about some other barriers to you know um, that you've encountered um, uh, as you've you know created work, made work, and and then tried to um, bring it to the wider world. Um, 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 and and I'm also intrigued by what Hijinx does, uh, um, uh, creating a sort of a professional development. Um, <laughs> Um, and um, uh, support around that, and uh, that must be a, a barrier-laden endeavor uh, as you um, um, oh, yeah. get your, yeah. get your folks working. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, ooh, yeah. Where to start? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, in terms of uh, the process of making work, you know, the way that we believe well, that is the most accessible is, is to devise our work, which is why, why we do it that way. I mean, to, to have a script-led process, for me, is, is something that is, is just unworkable for many of our performers. Um, so, which is why we choose to start with a blank page and, and, and to ensure that the text that is, does become part of our productions is the text that's spoken by those performers, so it's spoken in the way that they may speak. Um, and uh, and then and uh, you know you ensure then that everyone kind of has that ownership of of, of what the story is and where it's going um, and who who they are within it. Um, so that's that's one kind of uh, barrier, if you like. Um, the. The, the thing about the, the, the training and opportunities, but also our work is in the UK, in the, there's still a stigma attached for a paying audience mm -hmm. that, that, you know, mm. you're asking people to come to a production and there's still that thing of, okay, it's a cast that it, it includes um, performers, you know, of all types, kind of neuro, uh, divergent and neurotypical, and it's, there's the attitude that it's the quality is not going to be there, or mm. this isn't going to be for me, um, or it's in some way not going to live up to the ticket price. Or uncomfortable. Or uncomfortable, yeah, uncomfortable. yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, that's a battle, and it's one that's, that's improving for us as our, our kind of name um, becomes more known, I guess. Um, but it's something that that's one of the reasons as well that we started the festival, you know, to, to and that's what festivals are great for is, is is building those audiences and changing perceptions in that way. Um, but it's it's an ongoing sort of battle, really. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's the same as any theatre company, you know, you need to develop trust in your audience, mm -hmm. you know, to get them coming back again and again. But it feels like for yeah, it's a, it's it's a harder task. For companies like like ours, um, because it's all kind of mixed into those perceptions that we're trying to change. Um, but and in terms of, of, of our performers working both for us and for external companies, obviously there's a whole package that needs to be tailored um, in terms of a person's support mm -hmm. um, to, to to go and work outside of the company and for us as well. I mean, we've got another production on the road at the moment in the UK mm. with obviously an entirely different cast um, and three very different um, performers from our academy who have very different support needs. I mean, Lindsay, Richard and Gareth, you know, you've been on the road with Fred to all sorts of places um, and they're incredibly independent. Yeah, is that true to say you guys are I, I, the same I probably am yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 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 still we have you know if we're in a big city or something like that obviously we, we we take on a lot of that support for for making sure people are safe going out and around and know where you are and all that sort of stuff um, things that you don't necessarily have to think about if, if you don't have a neurodiverse cast um, so we on our tours we always have to ensure that there's a dedicated member of support support worker on tour with with the production and in the kind of climate we live in where is you know where you're making small scale theatre work which actually financially often you know is, is very difficult to justify um, to have the additional cost of a support worker on tour is a real is, is you know a tough thing and to then try and encourage an external company that that's what they need if they want to employ one of our performers with um, learning disability and or autism, then you know, there's another barrier there um, for that happening. Uh, yeah, does that answer? <laughs> it, it is, it was a, that was a, a sweeping question. Uh, yeah. yeah. no, can I, can I sure, please. There's yeah. a, a little story popped in my head, yeah. of, and this is around barriers, but like if I think about our barriers, they're kind of probably two biggies. And the first one is, of course, attitudes. Mm. And um, attitudes uh, toward folks who are different 
for the mainstream, and the other is money. And, um, but I'm going way back early, early on, and um, in, in our early period, we did not charge admission, and way, you know, very early. And so then I got connected with, um, by chance, with a director in Rhode Island, Rhode Island and, um, and of a company for adults with, or children with disabilities. And so he, I think he happened to be in Brattleboro and was visiting NYT. So then I got connected with him that way. And so I called him because I really wanted to find out more about his work and what he was doing. And so, and he was great. He was very, very open. And then he started asking me about Theater Venture. And this is probably five years into it for us, approximately, or less. And three. Um, so <laughs> about three. We got into yeah. pragmatics, and then he said, because he's he was very much part of a theater organization, and they fully funded everything, and you know, salaries and so forth. But then he came back to me and he said, well, Laura, um, tell me, what, what are you charging for admission? And I kind of stammered and said, uh, nothing. And he said, why are, you, why are you not charging admission? Are you, like, do you feel that your actors aren't good enough? And I stopped dead in my tracks. And, then, and what he was really helping, like with a mirror, he was helping me realize we do not need to make excuses for our actors. Matter of fact, we need to promote them. And over the years, and I, I'm sure this has happened for you too, Ben, we've had many audience members say, this is like the most exciting theater that I've ever been to. So it's not that we need to prove ourselves, well, we partly do, but, but, but more, let's show people like these possibilities, like you guys and Meet Fred, which I can't wait to see Meet Fred. And so it, 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 it really flipped me around of, as, as one of the directors of this program, am I embracing the attitudes that I want other people to embrace? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I have totally changed my thinking after mm -hmm. that. You, yeah. you all have used the phrase changing perceptions and right. For uh, ourselves that includes, as well. your, that includes yeah. your own. Well, absolutely, um, yeah. 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 We've learned right, right along with our troop Troop teaches us, we teach them, we're all mm -hmm. teaching each other. Mm -hmm. And that's really um, the joy of the work and the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the depth of respect for each other within the work. One of the things I encountered e even from um, people writing or thinking from a, um, a fairly sensitive uh, point of view uh, to this was uh, there's still a transactional nature. If you, mm -hmm. if you are inclusive, then uh, donors, audience, funders will will uh, line up to you, and that's a good reason uh, to do it. And I think advancing um, advancing beyond the transactional nature into um, in, into uh, uh, the fact that it's a practice or the experience of it being a, a continual practice. Again, you were already practicing it, and you had your perceptions um, change, flipped, deepened, broadened. Um, and you know that feels very much, uh, you know, it's not a deal that you're making, but it's a practice. Um, uh, and to me, that seemed like an important, um, important aspect of inclusive theater. I wonder if any of you had any any thoughts about about that um, particular notion, um, and the importance. And uh, in the absence of that, uh, if you'd like, can you speak to Elijah's experience uh, and and oh, um, sure. and uh, the experiences of other. Um, other folks you've taught, yeah. worked with. So um, my son Elijah has cerebral palsy, and he also has cognitive challenges. Um, we use, I mean, I always say he was born to be a teacher. When he was 11 weeks old, we were in a, a body-mind centering movement therapist workshop retreat and he was the teacher, and he's been the teacher ever since. He teaches us every day. We use him as our role model to say, if Elijah doesn't get it, we've got to figure out another way to teach it because he lets us know <laughs> right away if he's bored or whatever. But I'd and have also to say- also doing some nonverbal 
Elijah reminds right. us, don't just work with words. It's really important to put words aside some of the time because we're so word-oriented. And when, when uh, our very first troop that we had in 2004, what amazed me was uh, I homeschooled him, but we did a lot of um, working with educators um, from the University of Vermont. And, you know, one thing they said was, you know, he needs to have some adult-driven activities. He can't, he just can't rule everything. Because he needs to learn how to have attention. Well, here we are, 12 students. We're going one by one by one. They're all sharing something that's important to them each day. My son, who is so distractible, is sitting on the edge of his seat like this, looking at everyone go around the circle for, what, 20 minutes? He's like, I was just like, I gotta get a picture of this. <laughs> I mean, so every day he teaches me something and he's learned more words, you know, he's just in totally engaged. He kind of tells his caregiver when it's, when he knows when he needs to go out for his part, for his character. Mm in a show. He's like, up, oh, ready, come on. And she's like, oh yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> we're, we're going on in a minute. So he intuitively has learned, you know, 15 years. I think this has been the best thing. When I finally took him to school, I just said, it's not an option. Just put in his IEP, whatever you have to do. But this kid's going to theater adventure as part of his educational program because he's going to learn more there in three hours than you guys are going to teach him all day, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and it's really true because that's what speaks to him mm -hmm. and his way of learning. And we've seen that we've, my, my deep quote is that one day we were practicing and one of our students who rarely spoke, he has, has autism, he rarely spoke to us, and his character was going to sing Hakuna Matata. And I put the microphone in front of him. He sang clearly, articulately, and on key. <laughs> and, and all this commotion's going on, and Laura's like, cut! <laughs> Quiet on the set! <laughs> Do that again! <laughs> and, you know, and so right there for me, a whole, you know, I mean, so I learned about cerebral palsy and nonverbal communication and cognitive, you know, disabilities and everything. But, you know, still for me, learning about people on the autism spectrum or a student who's deaf or a student who's blind, that's all new learning just because you, because I have one kind of a son that doesn't mean I know everything and so that's been very exciting for us to learn so right there my whole idea about people with autism who can't speak you know what are they taking in we don't know because uh, you know sometimes it's hard for us to understand what they're understanding I was just blown out of the water with that young man singing no worries <laughs> and I would just add to that that um Elijah has helped remind us a lot that we all learn and that so often in our society we might think someone, oh, they'll never be able to blah, 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 and that's so not true at all. And so the belief in that we're all learners, and that means the teachers too. Yeah, but um, in terms of whether I see it as a practice, I think definitely um, as in, in making inclusive work as a practice. Um, again, that's one of the reasons there was the festival is because mm. to try and sort of show that it's not just us. There's companies all over the world that that, that are making this work and, and sharing this this practice. Um, but as m in terms of my role in the room as director, when we're devising our productions, I very much see it as being able to design a show that is going to show each of those performers in the, in show their strengths. Right. Um, so that's where it becomes, you know, a practice. 
Um, and it's like you say, it's that ability to be able to recognize suddenly, okay, wow, you're doing that. Um, okay, how can we, how can we, we use, use that? that. Um, and, and being open to that. Um, and being and open to the surprises. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they'll show, yeah. students will show things that were like, whoa, like you yeah. described, like, that's amazing. <laughs> that happens all the time. Um, and I mean, for example, in, in Meet Fred, and this is very much a part of the show for those that have seen it and the, you, those that will see it, is, is, you know, from the beginning, I always wanted um, one of our academy students to be one of the puppeteers on Fred. Mm -hmm. And we worked through puppetry, you know, for months on end with, with, with the students on the course and some of them became very, very good at it. Um, actually, I had one student who, who was probably you know, achieved the most in terms of technical ability. Yeah. And, and I turned and I asked him, look, do you want to join us on this production? And he said, um, no. I said, <laughs> I said, why not? I hate puppetry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So he, he, he refused to do it. He Talk wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. Um, so, so, you know, so he, he didn't come and join us actually in making the show. One of um, <laughs> our other great. students did, and he was also he was very good, but but he, uh, he, he he to have the skill to be able to to maintain the style of puppetry we use in this show over an extended sort of hour and twenty minutes um, is is a is a lot of focus mm -hmm. and a lot of yeah. sort of cognitive um, right. ability and discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's why in the end, and it's this thing of making sure you're working to people's strengths, is the decision was made that we would have um, the academy student playing characters alongside the puppet and um, our tutors being the puppeteers. Mm. Uh, but those are difficult decisions that sometimes you have to make if, you, if you're going to commit to, to everyone being able to play to their strengths and, and produce the, the best show that you could produce with that group of people. Uh, this might be a good time to have you elaborate a little bit more on Meet Fred, and what it's about, and and, um, and how did um, you know you are primarily a puppet, puppetry company? So uh, the decision to uh, make that foray as part of this. Um, be good. So yeah, I mean, primarily as we've been speaking about, we're an inclusive theatre company, um, but we did a workshop in 2014 with a company called Blind Summit, who are a fantastic um, puppetry company based in London in the UK. Um, and we, we learned in that week about um, the style of bunraku puppetry that, that they, they use. So they have sort of cloth puppets that they use as training puppets. Um, so what that meant is that we got a chance to, to both kind of observe and perform on these puppets. So I got kind of to experience what it is to be in that puppet, working alongside two other performers and improvising in the, in the moment. And it's very kind of, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Um, and that, the inspiration really from that was just to, to kind of, in some way, make a puppet show using one of these puppets. Um, we went away, we, we ordered a number, like we had seven or eight Bunraku puppets made for us by Blind Summit. And then I came back and we worked for seven, eight months, kind of a day, half day a week, training with the students on the academy and, and exploring what worked, what didn't work, um, and some meeting some characters through the puppets, um, some, some of the sequence that sequences you see in the show kind of first started to take form through improvisations within those sessions. And then, then we kind of went into more focused groups of like eight performers, some of our academy students alongside some of the tutors to continue to sort of explore some of the themes. And at that point, the what became clear um, was this, the relationship between the puppet and his puppeteers, and how the puppet, you know, he, the puppeteers give the puppet life in, in the simplest form. Without the puppeteers, the puppet doesn't exist. And, and then the parallels between that and the reliance that many of our performers have on a support network um, to, to be independent within their lives and live, live full lives. Um, and what happens if that gets taken away? Um, so at the time that we were making the show, um, 
was austerity, it was a big buzzword around Europe, the crisis, and um, the government was, was making a lot of cutbacks to services and people's benefits. Um, so people, this support was being taken away um, through various bureaucratic systems whereby people were asked to reapply for different benefits and through that process were, were losing their benefits. Um, so a lot of our students were going through this change. It was a big um, stress in people's lives um, within the disabled community. And that whole atmosphere, I guess, started to kind of bleed into the work that we were making in the room. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what the show became. So, so Fred, um, I mean, Fred is, but we always explored it through the puppet. So it was never, you know, those, those were themes that were bubbling around, but it was always about, you know, okay, so if Fred wants to live in the real world as a puppet, you know, how is he going to do that? So that's, that was always the, the approach, but then the similarities of it were obvious. Yeah. The, more the, we parallel, through it. the parallel yeah. issues, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I felt that, just your little demo the other day. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I was like, Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's our life in a nutshell. And people brought their experiences to the room, so Fred has to go to the job center, you know, and, and go through all that kind of ridiculous trying to be made to, to get a job, none of which are appropriate for him, um, but always with the threat of losing some of those benefits if he doesn't agree. Um, I mean, definitely that's something um, that, you know, you, that was an experience, Richard, your experience with the job center was something that kind of was very yeah. pertinent during the making of the show. Yeah. Do you want to? Oh uh, yeah, um, well the truth behind the job sense scenes was that because um, in the Fred, don't think giving any spoilers here, I play a really horrible character who's, <laughs> um, who works at the job centre and basically in real life I was at the receiving end pretty much, I was the one who was um, who's the one who's like going to the job centre, going to these interviews and the and the benefit offices and that, and they asked the most stupid questions and they took away my benefits because they learned that I was because of the fact that I said I was learning to drive. So uh, because yeah, naturally, um, neurodivergent people can't drive naturally, but I mean, yeah, they took it off and so. So you had to fight for to get that reinstated. Yeah, I was frightened. So I yeah. think the first thing that happened when I found out that they took it away was I actually text uh, Ben and Dan like um, and I swore I swore out of fear as well. Like I was like, oh my god, I, I, my my head's gone. What am I gonna do? And like that. And so when it came to performing this character, Meet Fred, I just wanted to put as much venom and disgust into that role. <laughs> as much contempt as I wanted to throw in there. Okay. Just so, yeah, hopefully a little bit more of a realistic interpretation of what I, I felt yeah. like being in there and being, yeah. uh, being like interrogated, I think is probably a good way to describe it in that particular situation. Yeah, so, and we just follow the story through, you know, of, of kind of always, as we were making the show, it's, um, you know what's the next logical thing that could that could realistically happen here, um, and you know I won't give much away, but I'm gonna try not to give anything away. But yeah, but we see. Yeah. One other area I'd like to quickly explore is um, changing perceptions in the wider community and and um, how you feel that's going and um, yeah. Um, I think it's. Uh, and certainly this show as well is, is the show that's really taken us you know, beyond just being able to visit the similar sorts of festivals that we run, those inclusive festivals where um, in many ways you're already in an environment that's preaching to the converted, if you like, um, to, to, to more mainstream festivals that aren't, you know, the, uh, where, an, where audiences you know, aren't coming already prepared for, for, for the sh what they might see here. And I think that's when you start to sort of, yeah, start to really, um, really hope that you're, you're making, starting to make that difference because you're reaching the people that, that 
Maybe you know, reach. Yeah, you want to reach it. Exactly. Yeah. Door. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's such a difficult thing, though, and this is to have as a company that that aim and vision that we want to change perceptions within society. It's an impossible thing to actually quantify. You know, when you're succeeding in that and what exact impression you're having, yeah. without you know giving out various questionnaires with the obvious <laughs> yeah. questions in there where you're not really going to get that realistic. Well, it's qualified. What does 20% yeah. more exactly. open look like? But yeah. it's, you can only hope, really, that, that that's the case. And, you know, we, we get some, sometimes there's, there's feedback that, you know, is offered that, from people, um, which is lovely. But, yeah, we, we hope we're, we're getting there. We have felt that with, um, as I said in our early days, it, you know, our audience were families, families of our students. And um, over the 15 years, our audiences have really grown a lot. And we have sold out audiences now, but that's 15 years of doing the work. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's very exciting. Yeah, and it's very, very exciting. And we get lots of comments from people um, and uh, yes, absolutely, we want to do what we can, can do to help shift thinking and really open people's minds to thinking differently. Um, you can't make that happen, but I think it's all by invitation, and I think it sounds like hijinks definitely, and I think Theater Venture, uh, um, a quality of the work that we present on stage, I think, is invitational. It's, it's um, presenting actors who are passionate about what they're doing, which automatically sets a tone of, oh, <laughs> and, and, and opening. But that you can't make that happen. I think it's the power of theater yeah. is what it kind of boils down to. Now I understand hijinks got to uh, come to theater adventure, uh, mm -hmm. have a little interaction. How did that go? Uh, what did that mean? It was great. And I was going to say, Jen, great. one of our students at the very end, I was so taken. Um, she just very freely you know, raised her hand. We were in a circle. And Jenny said, this was really great. I am so glad to know there are other theater companies mm. for people who have disabilities, or however she says. Yeah, especially in another country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my, my hope and, and uh, sort of wish, as I was talking with all of you, is what can we do to clone you, bottle you, franchise you, um, you know, turn you into seeds that could be passed out? <laughs> and, you know, I uh, appreciate hearing that you have, um, you know, added other locations yeah, and have grown. Very um, but um, it's, it's gone beyond. It's gone. Abs um, we went to China in in May wow. with, with this show, and we we have uh, an organization in China, AC Orange Theatres. They're the second largest theatre kind of group in China that have uh, how many theatres? Ridiculous amount. Um, but they they at the moment are trying to. Um, basically by rights to run what we do in China. Oh. So we have this ridiculous, we have no idea what yeah. it's gonna to lead to. Like I mean, they want, they're buying, they want to buy the exclusive English language version rights to meat bread, an exclusive Chinese version of meat bread. Um, and they want to buy exclusive rights to all future hygiene productions to tour in China. Wow. Wow. And exclusive rights to run the training that we do. Um, you know, it's a world we have no experience of or concept of. It's very exciting. Um, it also uh, throws up lots of questions um, about control and, and <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Um, but the spirit is that they, 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 they want to be able to, you know, offer more opportunity for for um, their communities with disability in, in China, which is great, very positive. Yeah, yeah. It's very, yeah. yeah. It's it's very important. Yeah. It's very interesting. Interesting. Yeah. interesting concept yeah. to so, franchise so in, 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 in a contractual way, right. uh, things that happen organically. Exactly, and yeah, it's a absolutely. Fascinating, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, by economy and, uh, yeah. Are you are you engaged at all in, in in training future trainers and artistic directors and directors of, um, uh, in in your in your work as well? Um, not so much. Um, we we certainly have a lot of interest in our academy. Often, so people come and visit, and and we're very open to having people to come and, and see how it's run and um, and look at it as a model. I mean. The actual model of the academy was something I, I spent three months in Spain with a company in Seville called Danza Mobile in 2010, and it was there that I observed they have a five-day-a-week training course and you know professional performance companies alongside it for their dancers. So it was that model that then we modelled the academy on. Um, uh, so we're in turn very open to coming to people coming to visit and, and really learning sort of a bit more in depth about. About how it all works. Um, yeah. That's good. Um, we are so small. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but what I I do want to give a little shout out to very quickly to um, a couple things that are currently happening for Theater Venture. A couple, a few things that are currently happening for Theater Venture that's really exciting. And one of those things is that uh, we did get a grant from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And it's called Seeds. We just mentioned Seeds. And um, we have mentors who are actors in the Thursday troupe. And they come in the Wednesday troupe. And they help role model. They help, they help um, modeling, acting, and being friends and buddies and so leaders. And leaders. And so those four mentors are being trained to be trainers to other adults with disabilities. And we're using theater as the vocabulary, as the context for how we're teaching some of these leadership skills. So we're in the throes of that right now. And so we're going in the state. We have um, two sites here in Brattleboro, Families First, the Inclusion Center. But we're also going up to Springfield and Bellows Falls, ACRS. And so we'll be working with adults with developmental challenges. So, um, so our mentors are learning to be the leaders in that. So it's very, very exciting. And related to that is a training guide. We call it a training guide. It's not a good name for it, but a book. And it's a book about theater venture, but it's very practical. And it's a book that we hope, um, we're, with the final chapter to write, is now about the Seeds grant. And it's a book that, and it's very specific about not just our history, but how we do what we do. And, um, and so the goal is to get this finished this year. And the idea is to send it out to communities and knowing that their inclusive program won't look like ours, but this is an idea that help people get started. I think we have time for a question or two from the audience, anybody? I've questions? actually seen the show, and I want to say when I first saw it, I really couldn't tell who, there was no difference in the actors to me between people who were neurodiverse or not. And it was very impressive to see that whole, um, the acting, the story, every, the, it's a very compelling show and it was very fun. And um, it, I was just so impressed by the quality of your performance with the actors. Um, and I also am impressed, and I, I wish this was after so I could talk about it more, but um, that you put out some challenging attitudinal things about what's going on on stage. And I think that it makes, a lot of people uncomfortable, like trying to figure out how am I supposed to feel about this? Because it's very challenging, and I, I'm really curious to hear how other people will respond once they've seen it here, you know, because it's, it's excellent. And Ben knows I've been a big supporter of theirs <laughs> since I first saw the show. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, you're welcome. Really quickly, what's uh, next for? Theater adventure. When, when, can uh, we see, when can we see you next? We're, well, Ben and you guys got a little taste of this. The Thursday Troop 10 years ago did a show called Raising Our Voices, which was a show about them. And, um, and then it was a great show. We really loved it. But they were telling us they didn't really want to do a show about them. They want to be in characters and they want to be in stories. And um, so we had done 10 years of that, lots of different stories. And, um, but and so the last three years we did Shakespeare, and we did some pretty exciting, mm. we think, pretty exciting Shakespeare. And um, at the end of last year's season, many of the students said, 
that was great, but can we move on? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so what we came to was this year is Raising Our Voices Together. And we're going, it's a totally different show from 10 years ago, but it's about them and it's a musical. And the music uh, Ben and your, and your troupe got to get a taste of, yeah. we're beginning stages with it, we're just launching it right now. And, but some original music and the themes that we got from the students that are important themes in their lives are independence, working, friendship, and romance. And so those are the topics that we'll be approaching and addressing. And we'll show. have a preview, which every year we have a fashion show. Um, and so that's yeah, coming fashions up of the spring production. November 9th. And um, so this Raising Our Voices Together will be the focus and a, give a little preview of what's to come for our spring show in April. And we have a rack card over there that has a bunch of information about us and our shows and so forth. Thank you to all of you. Really appreciate it. And, and thanks to you for being here. Um, really appreciate it. Thanks yeah, thanks, hi, James, for coming. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was really Pleasure. Fun. Thanks for having us.